And this afternoon, we're keeping our focus on events on our roads. You know, potholes on our streets and roads are getting exposed around this time of the year because we're experiencing rains around uh, this season. Uh, we here at Joy News are shining the light on all potholes in Ghana. Yes, all of them. And that's uh, a lot of work, as many of you I believe uh, this will be one of the most difficult tasks to be carried out by anyone in Africa. Uh, if not impossible, at least we can uh, cover a great stretch. Uh, we have our special uh, features, uh, excerpts of a demonstration at uh, Teshe and a conversation with contractors who have not been paid. Before any of that comes up, here's how you can help expose all of those uh, potholes. Just go onto social media and post a photograph uh, of any of the potholes you find, and don't forget to add that hashtag, GH Potholes. Now, a stitch in time saves nine, uh, but certainly not on Ghana's roads. Uh, the rains have once again exposed Ghana's uh, monstrous, craziest, and deadliest uh, potholes. Many portions of our roads would not have deteriorated into gaping holes uh, if state agencies had fixed them on time. Today, Koji Yangsen kicks off Join News campaign, Ghana Potholes Exhibition, which exposes what he describes as windows uh, and, uh, of course, uh, widowers uh, making manholes on our roads. Much as it is the role of the media to scrutinize government, it is also important for the press to give them credit for their achievements. Now, one particular achievement for which the press has failed woefully in an unjust, unfair, and unsportsmanlike manner to give government credit for is this, our potholes. Jagged edged moon craters peppered artistically across the asphalt canvas of our national road network, turning 10 minute journeys into 50 minute torture sessions, wreaking almost as much havoc on your spine as your shock absorbers. Yes, Ghana's potholes are one of the uncelebrated triumphs of leadership for which our government must not only be lauded but applauded. Now, what most people don't realize is that these monstrous death traps are not actually signs of the incompetence of our government supervisory bodies. They don't point to any lack of skill on the part of our road contractors. No, these are actually clear evidence of the unmitigated success of some of government's top flagship programs. Programs, I hear you ask. But for the answer to that profound question, we must take a closer look. Look at this one. Mid sized, quite deep, uh, shaped like some sort of uh, asphalt amoeba. To you, this is an accident waiting to happen. But to the government, this is perfect for planting corn. Yes. Sir. It's not just good for planting corn, potholes are perfect for rice plantation. As the rainy season approaches, the true value of these potholes becomes apparent. They are perfect for a farmer in planting planting for food and jobs. So there you have it. If you have ever wondered why some of these potholes you see on virtually every road in this country of ours never get fixed, well, now you know. And that is not the only flagship program that government is delivering to rip-roaring success with these cherished and beloved potholes. There is also one village, one dam. Just think of the irrigation potential for the planting for food and jobs project we saw earlier. We're still not done. Look at this. Look at the deadly jagged edge of this particular beauty, shaped like the fangs of a village witch.
Okay. What do you think happens when your car hits this pothole at speed? Obviously, you immediately need spare parts. After a few encounters, a whole new car. If government is able to maintain a few of these widow-making potholes across the country, just think of what it will do for the automotive industry. One district, one factory. So the next time you feel like throwing your hands up in despair at the state of our rules, the next time you wonder why government keeps throwing money at incompetent contractors to construct roads which after three months will break out in potholes like a prepubescent teenager's face breaks out in pimples, just remember that these are the evidence of your government's stellar performance. Why would they cover them up? Reporting from Ahaya Kwanhu, my name is Kujo Yangsen. You've seen that for yourself and all you need to do to support this campaign is to share your potholes, a picture actually, with that hashtag GH potholes. And uh, of course, you can also do the hashtag join news. I will be glad to share that with the rest of the world. But the man behind all of this is joining us. Kuju Yangsin is here. Uh, and uh, well, some may make fun of, mm -hmm. you know, the attempt to demonstrate and to illustrate how bad the situation is by planting rice. <laughs> Mm -hmm. what, what else did you plan? Tomato. Okay. <laughs> but, but it's also indicating the seriousness of the matters that, that we're looking at today, Kujo. And for you, I'm just wondering what, what motivated you to kickstart all of this. You're right that this is really an illustration of how serious the problem is. I mean, satire is powerful. And you know, they always say if you keep doing the same thing and you're not getting the results you want, you need to change it up. Yeah. We've been talking seriously about how bad these potholes are. And the potholes exist still. There's no road in this country that doesn't have potholes on it. Yeah. So we thought we'd better apply a different strategy. You know, let's poke fun at it. If people think that these potholes should not be covered up, then okay, let's lean into it. Let's exhibit them. Let's, let's, let's display them. If you are not going to cover them up, then we'll display them as if they are works of art. Yeah. So this project is designed to poke fun at these things that are really serious problems. They are health problems. They cause serious uh, you know, issues for, for people, pregnant women and so forth. And the cost to you know, vehicular maintenance, you cannot calculate. So we're making fun of a serious problem just to demonstrate how serious it is. And this particular area where you found the story, uh, we must point out, it's not a remote area, uh, somewhere in the villages. So I can imagine mm. what their plights will be by this time. This is right in the center of a cry. It's Kolibu, you know, at the junction of Kolibu. This is where, you know, traffic is incessant all day long. Mm -hmm. People trying to get where they are going, people trying to be productive. And when they get to this point, they have to slow down yeah. and add an extra God knows how many minutes to their journey while damaging their car in the process. And you're right, this is the center of the capital city. Uh, the further out you go, the worse the situation we'll is. Get. So we really want to encourage people to demonstrate how bad this problem is in their area using the hashtag GH potholes. We want pictures, we want videos. If you're doing a video, be as descriptive as possible. Be as eloquent as possible. Describe the problem with as much vim as you can. Let's demonstrate to those whose job it is to either prevent this from happening or to fix it when it does that we have seen the evidence of their incompetence. Uh, and it reminds me of one man who's uh, in, in some level of authority to fix the challenges. Mm -hmm. He says he loves evidence-based lectures. That's what we're doing. Yeah, so I guess that's what we're doing, using social media. So what's his... <laughs> and, <laughs> okay, <laughs> someone is asking me to mention a name, but no need to go there. <laughs> uh, um, so, so let's talk about the expectation uh, mm -hmm. from the general public. Yeah. How do we get involved? How, how do we get everyone on board to support this yeah. GH potholes? hashtag that's going on. Yeah, so it's really simple. There is a pothole somewhere near you or somewhere on your way to work, to school, to whatever you do, you know, to make a living. There is a pothole that is a big problem for you. Take a picture of it. Take a video of it. And of course, stay safe. Don't do this while traffic is, you know, uh, moving fast around you. Take videos and describe this pothole, okay, and how it feels to drive through it or to be driven through it every single day. Talk about how long it's been there. Do you know there are potholes in this city that have been there for 30 years? And no one is paying attention. Same pothole. 30 years. And we're bringing you some of these. We call them intergenerational potholes. Amazing. We're bringing you that story as well. 
you know, just we've all seen them. We all drive past them. Nobody does anything to fix them. It's ridiculous. You know, so what we want people to do is to take control of the narrative. Take the pictures yourself. Add a caption. Use the hashtag GH Potholes, of course. Add the hashtag Joy News to it and share it. We will see it and we will definitely jump on and make sure the whole world sees what is happening in your area. Somebody's got to pay attention. And what's dangerous about the prolonged nature of this is that we're beginning to accept it yeah. as though it's the norm. Yeah. Well, it's fine. It will get fixed someday. Um, once we're alive, we're hopeful that, that it will get fixed. That's dangerous too. Absolutely, because what we're doing is we're normalizing incompetence. Okay? The fact that a pothole appears means that the road was not properly constructed to begin with. And we know that this happens. Okay? We build, we construct roads, and halfway to the conclusion, we stop. Either because there's no more money or because uh, you know, we, we decide that we've done enough, let's go and fix some other person's, uh, some other area. So, so these roads are badly constructed, that's why we get potholes. And if we normalize it, we are normalizing that incompetence. Okay, so people will keep constructing roads to a poor standard and leaving them because they think we are okay with it. Well, we're not. And this is how we show them. Uh, what else will, will feature in the series that we're likely to see? Because um, multifaceted. Mm. First of all, there's the government appointee, the one in authority, the mm. policymaker who's supposed to ensure that all of these problems are fixed. Mm. Then we have road users also coming on board. And the contractors, it appears we're not paying attention to them as much. Absolutely. Because so, the quality of the roads mm. also matter. Yes. So this, is, this, this series is going to go deep. You will hear interviews. We will interview people who benefit from the presence of potholes. We will interview those whose construction was so poor that it has resulted in these potholes. We'll hear the farcical answers that they give to our questions, our very serious and pointed questions. We are going to take you to potholes that are so strategically located that it's almost as if they are there on purpose. We are going to take you to potholes that are galamse pits in people's backyards. Oh. We are going to take you to potholes that, like I said, have been there for 30, yeah. 40 years. People, since they were children, have been driving through the same pothole. They are now adults. We're going to tell you these stories in a way that just points out how ridiculous it is that as a nation, we've decided to live and walk around these massive blights on the landscape of our road network. The Year of Roads? Oh, is that in focus too? <laughs> <laughs> Which year of roads? We've had five. Oh, okay, the year of roads. <laughs> the enhanced year of roads. Uh, the, and... the advanced year of roads. The year of roads pro max. Yeah, we'll take you through all of them. It's embarrassing. Anyway. But, but we also need to stress that if you're joining this campaign on social media, th there's a seriousness to it. Mm. Uh, so persons attempting to make fun, yes, that's fine. Mm. But don't go and import images mm. of, of something which is not a, 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 We're only existing interested in the truth. in our country. Yeah. The truth is bad enough. You don't have to make up anything. The truth is bad enough. Just come out of your house. You will see examples. There are enough examples that you don't have to make up fake stories in order to demonstrate the seriousness of this. No, 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 no. There is an example in your area that is bad enough. You don't have to make it up, make it up at all. Okay. Uh, could you someone is applauding you for your acting skills, <laughs> but we'll, we'll talk about that later. So the hashtag is GH Potholes. You can add the hashtag join news to it yeah. as well. And then uh, we'll if, if I may, just we'll before we leave, the, one of the most important things I've noticed is how other media houses have jumped in on the trend. It makes me so happy. I've got to thank them. I've got to take a minute to thank all the other media houses that have decided that this is important enough for them to join. Oh, in. that's encouraging. We welcome them. We're so glad that they've seen the seriousness of it. This is what yields results. Mm -hmm. You remember, we, we, the media came together when it was uh, about, Galamsey. about yeah. Galamsey. It's about potholes, and we absolutely need to come together on this mm -hmm. as well. So a big shout to all the media houses who have decided to join yeah. in this campaign. We applaud you. Yeah. Let's keep it going. In fact, if you want to support Kojo in terms of production as well, you can always <laughs> join him. Uh, give him a call and uh, definitely uh, will be on uh, to fixing the challenge. Kojo, thank you. Thank you. Over now to Teshi because it's still related to this poor state of our roads. Uh, about 1,000 residents uh, there have uh, poured out to the streets uh, today, demonstrating over the bad nature of their roads. The residents are demanding that government fix the roads immediately. The demonstration is tapped. Uh, uh, Maba uh, Teshi, uh, and that's uh, of course my colleague James Aveji was there. Uh, he's coming through with this report for you.
Now, the concern this morning is that they want to send a signal to central government to come fix their roads now. Uh, I spoke earlier with uh, the assembly member for Teshi Nungwa Estate North, and he indicated that they have raised the matter several times at the assembly meeting level, but uh, according to him, the MC doesn't seem concerned about the applied. Uh, the last time they spoke with him, he indicated that if they are not, uh, uh, if, if they are not uh, really ready to wait for government to fix the road at its own time, they can go to court. Let's pick the thought of some of the residents. Uh, okay, so uh, I have uh, one madam here. Madam, tell us about yourself. Why? Assembly woman, I've already okay. spoken. Or actually. For which, for which electoral? Said okay. no. Tell us uh, why you are on the street this morning. Because of our roads, we are here because of the state of our roads. The state of our roads is very, very bad. And we have spoken to our MC, Honorable Medical, several times when we go for general assembly meetings. We tell him the state of our roads. He keep on giving us excuses, which we do not understand. That is why we are embarking on this demonstration. And this demonstration is not about politics, it's not about NDC, it's not about MPP. This uh, demonstration is about Teshi. That is why we are here. How does the road affect your businesses? It affects us seriously. When buying and selling is not moving, when you pick a taxi, you are going for a short distance. Instead of the taxi driver should take like 10 cities, the taxi driver will take 50 cities. And the residents are very, very angry. They are not happy about it. Yes. When you come to Greta Estate, the Greta Estate is supposed to be an estate. But when you go there, excuse me to say, it looks like a, it's not good at all. It's like a zongo, which is supposed to be a Greta Estate. But it's the state of the roads that is very bad. Okay. That is why I am the assembly member. And people keep on complaining. You, you mentioned some estate. What is the contribution of the owners of this estate to the community as well? The estates, we have our residence association. We have been meeting. And when we meet, we take our issues to the MCE, which I am the leader. When we go to MCE, he doesn't do anything about it. He keep on giving us promises. Now when he goes to the real minister, they also give him promises. So he will also give us promises, which is very bad. So we are sending this message to Honorable Medical. He should do something about our roads. Our roads is not in good condition. The state of our road is very bad. Most especially the greater estate there. That is why we are here. So that's the assembly member for Tashi Nungwa Estate North, uh, Honorable Doug, speaking to us about what they have been doing about the situation so far. Uh, but Madam, uh, what, 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 why are you on the street? Oh, it's because of the road. The road is very bad. The road is very bad. I, I'm called Millie Gold, Millie Gold from Tribal North, a uh, Star B branch, right? A communication officer, right? So the road is very bad. A communication officer for the, which party? For, for the NDC, uh, the NDC. And the roads are very bad, especially the Greater Estate and the first junction to Tribal Road is very bad. It's very bad. We have three miscarriages. Uh, women are having miscarriages. You understand? So I want to plead the MCE, that's Honorable Madika, to fix our road for us, please. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, uh, if you can see some of the inscriptions on the placards that they have been carrying, some read, our roads are future. Uh, our roads look like Galamsey's site. Our roads are not motorable. Uh, cost of maintenance is killing us, which indicates that the residents themselves have been doing some form of maintenance on the road. And so uh, those are dead trap potholes making our roads unaccessible. That she deserves a good share of the national cake. Those are some of the inscriptions on the placards they are carrying. About a thousand of them, uh, hundreds running into thousands of them are on the roads uh, to establish their displeasure. What sort of uh, uh, the traditional leader here? Uh, so thank you so much for your time. Uh, we are interested in what the traditional rulers have been also been able to do about the situation before it's getting out of hand. Tell us about yourself. Yo, Jimwe Mariga, Ingbaji Numu Ahunu Ulamu. 
No one who are here, don't know. Go on, I go camera man, I guess. Ever the bully me. We try to get what Ben won, you know, a year. No money, what is she? They won't fail her gun affair. Jay Wapet, a young capolis will only about you know, so that will only about you know, Mofemo will only get here. They are so well. What I saw, well, new Mofemo, and I enjoy it. Yeah, mommy, try no money. My name is Honorable Tahiru Alasan. I represent the Shinoway State South, the tri area. Yes. What exactly is the demand this morning? Oh, we are demanding our uh, uh, share quarter of the roads. Tessie roads are bad. For a long time, the MC come for 2020. He promised all the Tessie people that he's going to do a good road for us. He's going to do asphalt roads for Tessie. And so we haven't seen anything. When you go to the Zongo, when you go to the Tessie Nungwai Estate, all the roads are small. So the Tessie Nungwai Estate people say they are not even going to pay the property rate. The assembly is taking. So Tessi Mamba, Mamba Tessi, please, MC, we are begging you, please fix our roads for us. You, you, you are in the assembly. Where has the conversation been at the assembly level about the road? We 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 fought the MC about this roads. Always he promised us that he will do the roads. When we go to the assembly meeting, we even do that, do this road, do this and this. He will not do it. He will tell us that he has gone to the road minister. We should go to court. When we go to court, we should go and present our choices there. We go to the road minister several times. Several times, nothing has happened. One day he told us that, me, I didn't say, the road minister, when you go there, nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. So, ma abateshi. Ma abateshi. This part of the street, as well, they call the Coffee Street. It's actually from the first junction towards uh, the MC's office. The residents tell me that this is the road that leads to the MC's office, riddled with potholes. Uh, a major part of the uh, the quota that was poured on the street has been eroded off by rain. Uh, as you can see in your shot, these are empty sacks of cement uh, as well as uh, some other bags, which is an indication that the residents had earlier tried to patch the roads by themselves. Uh, when I interacted with them, they told me that uh, this is one of the various scenes you see on part, different parts of the street, uh, of the Teshi Ina street, where the residents themselves try to do uh, some kind of patch up where they fetch sand into sacks, uh, uh, both maize sacks, uh, used cement sacks and others and dump them in some bellies of potholes on the moving of vehicles. As these are some of the remedies that residents uh, try to do on the road, which turns at, uh, actually turns into obstacles on the road. Let's get more from uh, James Savage, who's joining us via Zoom now. Uh, and James, uh, I, I mean, I can tell that this is, in fact, feeding into our campaign, the reason for which we're talking about potholes, because it's part of the problem. But uh, has there been any response, for instance, from, from government on this? Uh, blessed. So the MC for the area, Modaka Pashi, was at the uh, municipal uh, premises to receive the petition the residents have sent to them. In that petition, they raise issues such as uh, pregnant women losing their pregnancy while using the road. Issues also came up that uh, the nature of the road has resulted in them uh, spending so much in transport. For instance, one of the uh, protesters mentioned that uh, for short distances that they used to pay about 10 Ghana cities, they now pay uh, about 40, 50 Ghana cities in, uh, for the same uh, distance. Uh, some also uh, uh, say that uh, the nature of the road has actually rendered their, uh, has actually declined their productivity because when you have to travel a distance of, of about 15 minutes, you end up uh, uh, traveling about 45 to uh, one hour on the same stretch of road. And so those are some of the concerns they have raised. And they have given uh, government some two months uh, to fix the road or they will initiate series of demonstrations to make sure that they get their share of the national cake. Now, receiving the petition was the MC, as I stated, uh, on behalf 
of government. Now, he noted that government has already uh, started uh, mm. constructions in some areas of the uh, Teshi enclave. Uh, he alluded to the fact that the government is doing some 16.9 kilometers of inner roads around Teshi. And so uh, he thinks that the, uh, the demonstration actually right. uh, came too early because had the residents waited a, a, a longer uh, time, they, the roads would have been improved. Okay, uh, so, so would not are, they now, are the residents the now assured uh, of the problems, I mean, being resolved by, by the MC, given, given what the MC is indicating? Yes, uh, although my interaction with them after the petition was received uh, indicated that uh, they are not uh, actually enthused by the MC stating that uh, the assembly or the government is not going to work with their two-month uh, uh, ultimatum because uh, in that petition they said they give the assembly or government two months, but the MC maintains that government cannot function within that two-month ultimatum that the residents are giving uh, uh, them and so they were not too happy about that but uh, nevertheless they returned home after the petition was uh, received hoping that uh, the rules will be touched uh, we can listen to the mc modekai akwashi uh, make the point while receiving the petition on behalf of government an ultimatum normally is given to somebody who needs an ultimatum to perform Clearly, the government of Nana, the government of Nana Adodakwa Akufuado doesn't need your ultimatum to perform. I've told you that we've given us four major projects in our municipality. And these are roads. Before last week, a contractor was given our roads. These roads are being done now. Clearly, the government doesn't need an ultimatum because they are already performing. How then do you give an ultimatum to somebody who has already is already performing? So we will perform, but I ask for the ultimatum. It's nice. Uh, they have their right to give an ultimatum, but we don't operate by ultimatum. We'll do our work at the appropriate time and we will do all the routes and bring them to the right standard at the appropriate time. We've started the work. We started before the, the demonstration. So we will finish the work at the appropriate, uh, appropriate time. This one will take about two weeks or three weeks to be done, the four routes that are happening. Does a no ultimatum mean that you will finish before the two months? No. Uh, whatever time we will finish, we will not finish all the routes before two, two months, no. But we will not work to ultimatum, as simple as that. I will not work to the ultimatum. The residents allege that at the Ajomang Junction, uh, the equipment that were, were brought to actually start the work have been taken away. Do we know why they've been taken away? It hasn't been taken away. Okay. As What's the issue? It's going on right as we speak. Work is going on as we speak. It's a, it's a big project. The guy won't be at one location all through the project, but the project is ongoing and we will not relent. The contractor will not leave until these four roads are done. When these four roads are done, we all know the four roads are done. For me, when I'm sick and I need, I go to hospital for help, I'm not going to give the doctor an ultimatum when he should heal me. <laughs> I will take the medicine and at the right time, health will come. What's the government's own schedule to complete these four roads? In fact, the schedule is overdue because things had to be suspended as a result of the IMF negotiation. So it is only now that we are resuming. So all planned work has been held up because of what we've all gone through, uh, IMF. And the IMF uh, thing was concluded about a week ago or two weeks ago, and government is on, on the ground, contractors on the ground doing the, the work. There's an important issue I picked up from interviewing the constituent that I need you to address. They said that, especially one of the assembly members said, the last time we sp they spoke to you or the assembly about this, you said if this is not going too fast to their liking, they can go to court, is that true? That's not true. I haven't engaged any of them on this. It is totally untrue. Complete fabrication. A figment of somebody's imagination. I've never said that. How many kilometers of road do you have to as part of the municipality? How much is it going to cost? The cost, I can't give you the cost now. But the, the roads immediately uh, deemed for um, construction are around 16.9 mm, kilometers. We know the total uh, uh, length of road that needs touching. 
Oh, the, yes, the toilet roll, I can share it with you. It is more than that. More than but that. These, are the, these, these are the key ones that we need in the town to be done. No, 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 the four rooms put together don't give you. There's a long list I will share with you also. The four rooms are only the first four, which are the key roads that we need to do. That's why we can name. But there's a list after the four rooms, there are about 12 roads. That are smaller roads, but 12 roads that we will do. But as I said, be there as it may. It's fine. All is well that ends well. This demonstration has ended peacefully. It's, it has been a good demonstration. The important thing is that our roads are being worked on. Anybody who lives in, in Teshi, the roads are being worked on. That's the most important thing. And the roads are being done as part of the plan of the government of Nanado Dan Fuadu to bring development to Teshi. I'm done. All right. To period poverty. It used to sell for just four cities, but now, as we speak, sanitary parts sell for uh, some close to 20 Ghana cities. That's the situation as we speak uh, for uh, a pack, and uh, of course, uh, that's like a five fold increase in the price. This has left a number of uh, women incapable of uh, buying sanitary parts during menstruation, not to talk about the teenage. Uh, girl out there. It, it is uh, the way it is because campaigners say uh, th there are too many taxes uh, being imposed on sanitary parts here in Ghana. This uh, afternoon, uh, of course, uh, we know that uh, a group of people were taken to the streets earlier today uh, just to demonstrate in the streets of Accra, demanding that government intervene into this matter by lowering taxes to help drive down the cost of sanitary parts. And, uh, there's more in this report for you. The day that I did not have a part, I stay home and use rag. It affected me. And the class said we went, we want to write. It was about, it's, um, the subject was science. It, my, my best subject is science. So it affected me. Last month, when I was facing my menstruation period, I was, my mother was unable to buy a pad for me, so I stayed home. And because of the shame, I was in the room. I was unable to get out. But in me, I want to be a lawyer in future. So if I do not go to school and learn hard, I can't achieve that goal. So I'm pleasing all the government that they should reduce the taxes on the sanitary part so that I can go to school and my, my parents can buy some of the sanitary parts for me. Also, let's expand the conversation on this. Uh, joining us in studio is a group of protesters. Uh, one uh, individual who was, uh, I mean, two of them, they were all part of the uh, demonstration earlier today. And uh, one is a female, so has first hand information on some uh, of these issues. Uh, we're uh, joined in studio now uh, by. Uh, a number of uh, individuals uh, who, who are part of uh, the CSO's platform. Uh, and of course, we have the e executive director uh, with uh, Renel uh, Ghana also joining through. We'll get you their names uh, shortly. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, the program. Let me start off by getting to know you. Of course, um, you, you are part of the demonstration today, right? Yes. Please. You run a CSO? Yeah, I run a CSO. Yeah, so I'm, I'm the lead uh, convener for Renel Ghana Foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We are here so advocating for and promoting the right of women and girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was part of the CSO platform who demonstrated today. And this whole conversation about lowering uh, the taxes, of course, we'll, we'll deal with the first-hand experience because there's a lady also uh, with us uh, today. Uh, but, but the issue about the taxes, is that where the challenge really is? Yeah, so what we've noticed is that uh, it's about the classification of uh, uh, sanitary products. So, like condoms are classified as health necessity. Mm -hmm. We believe that, first of all, government must uh, reclassify uh, the where sanitary parts are being placed as miscellaneous uh, 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 products, mm -hmm. which is uh, become a luxury. Mm -hmm. So, we believe that if it's being reclassified as health necessity, mm -hmm. uh, tax, it can be free, tax free also as well. And we believe that that can serve a long way to help our girls as well to achieve whatever goals and the agenda 2030 mm -hmm. government is supporting. Okay, uh, but, but when you decided to, to join the whole campaign today, were you doing that because of the concern you share with other women out there or you feel 
Well, because I'm simply I'm a woman, we all need to do this. Well, I think um, it should be both because first of all, yes, I'm a woman. Mm. And then I share concern because I feel like um, certain people don't really have it easy. Mm. And you can all see the fact that sanitary mm. pads are very, very expensive these days. So I believed like doing this will go a long way to help take the tax on the sanitary pads. Mm. And uh, of course, wh when, when you look at this whole conversation going on, wh why do you feel there's some sort of hesitation on the part of authorities, policy makers, to, to just listen to the call that you've been making all these years? I think this has been going on for a while. Mm. I don't really know if I should say they are not interested mm -hmm. or they feel it's, it's okay because mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, we are still buying the sanitary yeah. parts. So they feel like even if they keep adding more taxes, no matter what, since it's a necessity, mm -hmm. we are going to buy them. So I feel like they've just decided not to do anything about it. Mm. And in fact, uh, for, for those who are not getting the image of this and what we're talking about, Isaac Ejiz is with her. Um, he's a data analyst uh, here at uh, Join News and he's been looking at the figures, what it means for an average person out there to afford uh, these products that we're talking about. Um, so let's get to it. Isaac, uh, just take us away in terms of the data and what we have about the tax conditions and how we could possibly make it more bearable for, for, for the average person out there. Uh, Isaac, if you can hear me, I'm just asking about uh, the cost elements and, and how we could make it better in terms of uh, policy options available to government in terms of uh, the tax measures. I don't know if you are referring to me, because um, I'm Isaac Ofer from the Ministry of Health. Uh, yes, uh, and you are also joining uh, this, this whole conversation about um, the, the need to push for the lowering of the taxes. Of course, you've been listening to the conversation as well. Uh, just before I bring in uh, my colleague, uh, you also have a take on all of this and why, of course, we're seeing that challenge on the part of the health, uh, not just health, the finance ministry. And from your quarters as well, the question has always come to you, the need to push for the lowering of the taxes. Why do you think it's taking longer? Um, like I said earlier, I met them this um, afternoon on behalf of the Honorable Minister and my Chief Director. We received a petition from them. However, we acknowledge the fact that some concerns raised by them are genuine concerns. And the Ministry is also working on some policies to ensure that some of these issues are taken care of. They realize that the issue cannot be dealt with only by the Ministry of Health. Rather, it's the Ministry of Health, uh, Ministry of Finance, Parliament, Ministry of Sanitation, all of us coming together to make sure that this issue is dealt with. And so we give them the assurance that for the Ministry of Health, whatever that we are supposed to do, the Honorable, the Honorable Minister himself is so particular about some of these issues. And so he would work on his part and submit the proposals out. Rather, we plead that other agencies, other partners would also come together and then we put it together so that we are able to deal with this issue as early as possible. How soon will you deal with the challenges? Um, we at the Ministry of Health, my Chief Director, my Minister are seriously working on it. And we can't give any timeline now because we don't know what the other sister minist uh, ministries will also come, come up with but we believe that we will do our part of the bar. Mm. Uh, and Nelson, when, when you were at the ministry today, uh, did you get the assurance? And, and is this answer encouraging for you? Well, um, we, we, at least uh, he's saying that they, are, they will do something about that. That is why it's what you were saying. We know only a health ministry cannot um, achieve this goal. Yeah. So we've also sent petition to the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Gender, uh, the Speaker of Parliament, because these, these are the people, uh, the sectors that we believe that when they come together, it can happen. And this shouldn't be a difficult task to do because the Vice President himself has promised, even in 2020, uh, prior to the 2020 election, that they will take it off. So that is it's something that they can do. It's just a conversation they have to have a cabinet. And that, that can so be Do you feel it's as easy as that? Oh, because it involves businesses as well. 
But when the when government was men on uh, uh, imposing e levy, it was done. So why why should sanitary part tax be a difficult thing to do? Uh, for those who do not see the relevance and how that is affecting, for instance, our daily growth, development as a nation, what would you say to such a person? Yes, I I, I believe that if 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 you have a mom or maybe you have a sister, mm -hmm. this should be of a great concern to you because I'm sure you as a man, whether if you have a girl child or maybe you have a sister. You definitely give money out, and part of that money is being used to buy sanitary parts. So this should be a, a big concern uh, to us. Um, like the way we all advocate, when uh, when Ghanaians said they don't want energy, everybody came on board. An, an example is uh, the LGBTQ. Every church, every mosque, everybody is coming on board for us to make sure that it doesn't happen. So I believe that this uh, um, uh, a campaign that we all have to come on board and fight it like the way we are doing with LGBTQ where everybody must get involved. Are you seeing that support from, from government the way you want it to go? Well, we have been writing releases, and this is the time that we say we have hit the street. Mm -hmm. We have uh, petitioned sector ministries. So we are giving some time, and we'll keep pushing. We'll keep monitoring and following up on whatever the issue will be, and we believe that we'll make... Uh, uh, some impact. Yes. Yeah, uh, but, but, but the interaction has been going on with... Uh, I mean, fellow women and, and females out there, we, those who are younger than, than you are, what ex personal experiences do you, do you get from these people? Well, I'm coming from the northern part of Ghana, mm -hmm. and I can attest to the fact that it's, it's really not easy. The tax on the sanitary part is, is causing more harm because as in this age and day, there are certain girls that have never had the experience of using a sanitary pad. They don't know what it looks like. They don't know how it feels. They just don't have any knowledge Not about at it. All. And it's really depressing. Mm. When you go to rural communities and you are talking about sanitary pads, like when you see their facial expressions, I'm sure you are going to be touched because you keep asking yourself, wow, so there's really someone who has never mm. seen or used a sanitary pad before. And, and there are situations where we understand that some of these young girls are taken advantage of. Yes. Simply because of, of, of this period of poverty. Yes. This How is true not is a that? Movie. It's really happening. Yeah. Because let's say her parents cannot afford sanitary pad and there is just a boy around the corner mm -hmm. who can just buy her a sanitary pad. She becomes very vulnerable mm -hmm. because whatever he says, she's doing that mm -hmm. since he can produce the sanitary pad for her. Mm -hmm. So, if you're to add your voice to, to the thousands of, I mean, females and women out there, what, what would that message be? Okay, I'll just have to say, you are not alone. Mm -hmm. I know it's not going to be easy, mm -hmm. but this is a stepping stone. So, I'm sure it will get better from here. Mm -hmm. And, Mr. Ofer, this brings up the question about targeting. Why are you not targeting at least the vulnerable ones, trying to revise government policy so at least those in school and, and young girls have access to this um, sanitary products at, at a very reduced cost. Yes, um, like I said, I am limiting myself to the point of the Ministry of Health. And rightly, it has a number of stakeholders involved into confirming a particular decision regarding this uh, issue that we are discussing today. And so the assurance that I can give is that the Honorable Minister himself, Honorable Kwekwa Ajumameno, is so particular about issues like this. And so when we even submitted a petition to him, he discussed it straight away with the uh, Chief Director, that it should speed up with our part of the policy that we want to put up. So it will be difficult for the Ministry of Health to say that we want to target a particular group and leave another group. This is a holistic uh, agreement that should come from all the stakeholders that are involved. And so we will plead with time and at the right time, the stakeholders will come together, issue a particular statement to direct the way the policy will drive us. So, I, so what, what policy, and give us details of that policy, because a lot more people would want to know what, what concrete steps you're taking and how you'd want this policy to look like. Yes, like I said, it's today we received the petition today. And so we will factor in a number of issues that have been raised in that petition, mm -hmm. that particular to the Ministry of Health. And it, until we are able to do that, it will be difficult for us, for me here now, to come out with the concrete details of that policy. So I will say that at the right time, when we are 
okay with it. We'll publish it out like we normally do, and everybody will get access but, but, to it. But the policy you have going on now, it's not, it's not, it's not as a result of the demonstration, that, is it? Yeah, the assurance that I'm giving out is that I, they are aware. We came there with the director of pharmacies who spoke to them and had said a number of issues to them. And so, critically, the ministry is working on some, something. The yeah, ministry, but, but what doing, I'm asking is that the policy you have already running, you're not doing that yeah. policy because of today's demonstration. That's why I was asking yeah. about the details. Yeah, the policy we have running regarding, um, we don't have any policy regarding sanitary pad reduction. You know that cannot emanate from the Ministry of Health. It has to I, do I'm, with... I'm talking uh, about menstrual hygiene. You, you, have, you do have a policy. You're working on one if you don't. Yeah, we have a menstrual hygiene policy. But as we speak now, I can't talk about it because that was not the subject that I've directed to speak on today. But at the right time, I think it's available. Okay, but if you're working on it, exactly how are you working on it? You know, when you talk about the Ministry of Health, we have a number of agencies and then a, 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 a directorates under the ministry. And so taking one policy, when you take um, sanitary, like we're talking about, it cut across a number of directorates or uh, agencies. And so putting it together, you need a holistic assessment from the various stakeholders that are involved. And so if I am asked to speak to that now, it will be difficult because we received this petition just this morning. And so it will be difficult for me to say that this is how far we have worked with it. Are you, reacting, are you reacting to the policy or, or are you suggesting that the ministry is now getting aware or, I mean, you are now realizing that this conversation has been on yeah. for a possible reduction in, in the prices of sanitary products for these young I, I am, I am, I am reacting to I am re reacting to the extent of the reason why I am asked to speak to this. Yes, I but, went in for the petition. But and I obviously, you, you, have, the you, you have an overview of what, the ministry, is, of what the ministry is doing, right? Yes, please. Uh, so, so that's why I'm asking the question as to what's been I, happening over the years. Uh, and how come you're not able to share that with us? Oh, we've shared a number of policies on our website. We've shared a number of policies with our partners and all that. It's rather unfortunate that you said you don't have some of those policies. But I can tell you that when you assess our uh, website, we have a number of policies on that. The issue has to do with sanitary part and the reduction in tariff being taken out. And that is why I'm saying that as we speak, the ministry is not having a concrete decision on that. Mm. The ministry is working contribute to a decision that will be taken by a number of ministries. One, the Ministry of Finance will be the veto to declare that this is what is supposed to be done. Even that is subject to approval of parliament. Okay. And so if we are asking the Ministry of Health to make a statement that we are reducing or we are taking the tariff of uh, sanitary part off, I don't think it will be mm. fair on us. And that is why we are saying that we are collaborating with them. We are working together with them mm. so that at the right time we'll come out with a concrete decision that everybody will know of. Okay. And now, now, Senator Pierce, the problem goes beyond the Ministry of Health that you were learning. Yeah, but maybe you believe that... I think the reclassification, Ministry of Health can propose that to other sector ministry. I think that, that, that should fall within their jurisdiction. And I think even before I, I entered here, a sister of, as part of the program, the CDD, a meeting also going on the same topic on CDD. And I think I heard somebody from the Ministry of Finance saying, uh, even if they want to uh, take off tax, this is not the right time and all that. We should stop all those rhetoric because uh, Ghanaian said it wasn't the right time to take, to charge e levy, but it was, it, you can do it at any time. So uh, this is the time that we feel that everybody must you get know, mindful of the economic condition in which we find it doesn't ourselves. really matter people are still giving tax exemptions where we already have a lot but what to so look at looking at so are we saying that where we should allow our girls in the community to be absent from school because of parts so we don't have any any explanation to this we believe that they have to work something on it yeah, now yeah but he says it will take some time because there are a lot of agent, uh, agencies there are a lot of um, processes to also go through, a reason for which is not just a straightforward issue that you have the Ministry of Health dealing with this matter. 
So, so it may take longer than we. we yeah. So, expect. so uh, I'm just I'm only using Ilevi as an example. Okay. When government is meant on doing something, mm -hmm. government can do it. So, mm -hmm. I believe that this should be a, a priority that they should uh, take into consideration, and I believe this should, should go a long way to help our girls. Yes. Why, why not target the finance ministry? Yeah, we, we, are, we okay. have a petition with them also. As well. It's unfortunate they are not here as well. Okay. I was just talking to you about what one was saying okay. at a, a meeting that sister Okay, so they're, they're indicating to you that possibly they, they, they may not be able to do this because of the time in which we find ourselves. Yeah, so that is what I heard uh, at CDD. Mm. I was but you out. don't feel it's a, it's a no, 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 no. It, that, that cannot be an excuse. That shouldn't be an excuse at all. Wow. Latifa, what else will you do to mount pressure on, on, on government to, to deal with it? I think we will keep on advocating. We are going to keep talking and talking and talking till our voices are heard mm. and then our needs are met. We are not going to stop. Yeah. I know they will do whatever they can. He's saying they don't have time, they don't whatever. I'm sure if any of them has a relative in the rural community, they will definitely know what we are talking about. Yeah and they are going to work as soon as possible. I see. Uh, you, of course, you're a student as well, and you, you'll be joining hands with, with others. Um, what sentiments do you get from them, even looking at the kind of support your, your actions are generating starting from today? Do you feel that a lot more of your colleagues will join in the coming days to power pressure on, on government? Okay, so today, after we did the, the work, yeah. I had so many friends contacting me, and I've already gotten about five people who are willing to donate close to 10 boxes of sanitary pads. It's like people are really interested in what we are mm -hmm. doing, and I've gotten so many people on board already. Mm -hmm. I see, and, and that's what we're expecting. Nelson, any, any final words on, on what we should be expecting in the coming days? At least the conversation has started, and a lot more people are interested. I mean, just to know what, what the next step will yeah, be. Yeah, so the next step will be uh, Parliament is on recess now. We've got a petition for the Speaker. But they'll be back, I guess, next week. Yeah, next right? week. So uh, we, are, we will continue, and we'll soon we'll be engaging the uh, Parliament. We've sent a petition to the Select Committee on Health, mm -hmm. Gender, and Finance. Mm -hmm. So we'll be following up on all of them, and we'll, we could keep on pushing. We, we are about uh, 120 CSOs doing this. So We've, we are ready. How, how many do you say? We are hundred, yeah, who signed the petition? 120 CSOs wow. who signed the petition today. So we, are not, we will not keep, uh, uh, keep uh, keeping quiet. We will follow up and we will make sure that we achieve whatever that we want to. Mm. I see. Uh, interesting days ahead, but grateful to Nelson and Atifa for joining us uh, here in the studio and also to the head of uh, public relations at the Ministry of Health, Isaac Ofe for. Uh, joining us. Uh, we also do have some updates on uh, this uh, very situation coming through in terms of the uh, sanitary parts. Uh, we'll definitely get those updates for you uh, as we have them coming through. Okay, so here's what we have in terms of the uh, imports uh, level and uh, also matters relating to uh, what we've been doing over the years, right from 2015 and uh, now to 2021 where we are, 96.1% in terms of uh, uh, the amount in U.S. dollars, it keeps declining, uh, shot up somewhere in 2018, and uh, it keeps going down um, by the year, and where we are now is uh, 31.9, uh, and, and it's gone down, obviously, because of the uh, impediments, uh, I mean, talking about the taxation and other factors that are impeding uh, this whole situation. I will keep monitoring that space and bring you some updates as and when we have them. And you're welcome back to The Pulse. Food may be a hard business. More than 10% of people worldwide are hungry. 25% are overweight or obese, and another 25% are, of course, suffering micronutrient deficiencies, whether they are underfed or overfed. Uh, food is more than just something to consume long before uh, food reaches the grocery store shelves. Uh, the manufacturing process unleashes a slew of uh, elements that influence the length and quality of life on Earth. Forests are uh, cleared to make way for uh, the agricultural space. Uh, then the atmosphere uh, warms. Uh, diversity is systematically uh, reduced. Buffers uh, that protect humans from 
uh, animal-borne viruses such as COVID-19 are then removed. Uh, soil and water uh, contaminated and plants and animals are refused, um, of course, infused uh, with uh, some dangerous substances. So with a global population projected to reach 10 billion by 2050, uh, it is not uh, unreasonable to ask that question. How are we going to feed all of these people? I mean, given the projection that we have, and uh, more to the point, how are we going to feed these people uh, without uh, causing more danger? And that's why I want to have a conversation with Dr. Sheila Oshubazu, uh, who is the Executive Director for Alliance for Science, joining us now uh, in studio. Doc, it's such a pleasure to be talking to you. Um, welcome to Ghana, by the way. Thank and, you uh, very much. I'm just wondering where we've gone wrong as a, as, a, as, a, as a people. Where do you feel the problem is starting from? You know, you're starting from a very negative premise, but let me start from a slightly different place to say we as humankind have done an extraordinary job in living this long and, and growing to the extent we have. We have had across the world a green revolution. We learned how to um, uh, grow our food. We learned how to grow it at scale. We learned how to grow it despite challenges, kill pests. Um, and so, first of all, let's, let's recognize that we as human beings have the ingenuity to feed ourselves. You're eating today three times a day because there's a farmer in Ghana who is able to grow food despite very little support, inputs, etc. That farmer is still feeding you sometimes on less than an acre a day. So let's recognize where we have gotten from our ingenuity, from our own scientific endeavors. Where we need to do better, let me not say where we have gone wrong, where we need to do better is that we need to be smarter about how we grow our food. Um, the rest of the world grows industrial qualities of food. You said a little bit earlier, some are yeah. overfed, mm -hmm. some are overweight yes. in the global yes. north. Yes. yes, because they have an excess of food, they have an excess of choice. Um, we in the global south, uh, that's Africa, Latin America, Asia, we still are largely hungry. We still are largely food insecure. Interestingly, though, Ghana is one of the few countries that uh, hunger is not as bad Much as it is. Much of a challenge, right? Yes, mm -hmm. because um, you had good policies, so that's one part of a solution. You had a government that valorized farmers. You have a National Farmers Day. You understand the value of food and agriculture in your economies. But there are external shocks that stop us. Climate change, wars, um, COVID-19. Yeah. And so those challenges are global. Mm. And so where we have gone wrong is perhaps in not being agile enough to flip. Mm. We, Agility is what we need to survive the modern age. Uh, that that, that will be a key need. factor that we'll need. But I just wanted to pick up on one of the factors you were talking about, uh, which has dominated global discourse, the issue about climate change. Yes. How, how much of a, a factor is it looking at the issues of food security? It's huge. Um, I think you touched on it, but I know in Ghana, every year, at least 45,000 people are affected by floods. And affected meaning their homes are washed away, their farms are washed away, their livelihoods are destroyed. Every year, that's a lot of people. And they don't just pick up the next year and recover. So, the, 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 you know, the, they're taken back perhaps about 10 years in their recovery. And then, apart from floods, you have droughts, you have pests. <laughs> You know, so you have all of these challenges and you have a very vulnerable coastline that is being eroded. Mm -hmm. So encroachment on the sea is or, or, or onto land is very significant. You see it. So climate change is real. It's having an impact. Mm -hmm. We can't ignore it. Um, we are adapting to it, but we're not adapting well enough, fast mm -hmm. enough. But one thing we're advocating for in terms of food security, the one thing we can control is the quality of the seeds, mm. the quality of the inputs that the farmer puts in the soil. Mm. The soil may be flooded, drought, disaster prone, but we have agricultural technologies that allow us to mitigate against mm. that. Mm. So we have now new varieties that are pest resistant, strain and, and also drought resistant. And we use, those are from agricultural biotechnology, from researchers right here in Africa, right here in Ghana. Right. Well, WACI, West Africa Center for Crop Improvement, right. has over the last 20 years um, 
brought about such innovations. They've trained over 150 PhD plant breeders who are doing precision breeding mm. for this. So what we are advocating for is that the government should put this good seed mm -hmm. in the farmer's hands so that they yeah. have at least one less thing to worry about. And that's what I would describe as sustainable agriculture. It's very yes. crucial. Yes, it is. I mean, you, but you, you talked about it mm -hmm. in your intro. Sustainable agriculture is, um, the seed is one thing, mm -hmm. but you, you do you know... You need to go beyond that. You need to go beyond that and realize that our, our weather patterns are variable. But we're now in an age where we know, we can forecast weather to a high level of accuracy. What's likely to happen. What's likely to happen. So we need to tell the farmers, you know what, this is going to be a bad year. You know what, there is a pest coming. There's going to be a swarm of locusts. Mm -hmm. And put things in place. Our problem is we don't, we're not agile, we're not prepared enough and we're not agile in responding. Mm. Not that we don't have capacity. Beyond uh, government policy, there are a lot more stakeholders that must come on board. For instance, the Alliance for Science and other actors across the world. What's your expectation from them, by the way? Well, we as Alliance for Science, what we do is science communication. We try to expand understanding of the options so that the farmers can understand what choices they have. We try to get governments to make those choices affordable, so affordable inputs. We try to say, okay, what is the ecosystem around the land? Um, so what is the landscape? So you're looking at what are the climate challenges as this farmer is trying to grow? And what can the government do can the government start a mass tree planting campaign? Can they um, help to subsidize irrigation and drain? All those things that help the, the, the actual soil itself be healthy enough for the farmer to make a living. Well, that's, that's very necessary. Uh, but, but we're looking at the solution now and I'm wondering which of the initiatives, for instance, will be much more of a priority for your side and uh, for others to also consider, well, uh, we make the effort at solving uh, this global hunger crisis or issue that we're talking about. You're talking about, for instance, the Farmers' Day <laughs> as yes. an initiative that we have right here in Accra or yeah. in Ghana. I, I don't know what happens in other countries, but are there some initiatives that we should be, say, learning from the global north, even within amongst ourselves? What's there for us to consider? Well, yes, we are an alliance for science and we are advocating for evidence-based, science-based solutions to all of these challenges, climate change, hunger, food security. And we came here to, to recognize that Ghana has very early on recognized the critical role of farmers. You have a National Farmers Day. The president talks about the farmer of the year. You've had that for a really long time. And because you have that visibility, it means that your policies are in place and that the farmers have some sort of a voice. And we want other African countries, there are not many others that have this. So this is why we started a campaign here. Um, but on, farmer, on World Hunger Day, which was on Sunday, we started a campaign across eight countries in the global south, so Guatemala, uh, Bangladesh, Cairo, Senegal, Nairobi, uh, Zambia, and all of them were having dinners, all of them were giving awards to farmers, all of them were saying we need a National Farmers right. Day. Right. And that's the starting point of a conversation about what else do we need? Yeah. Okay, once you have a farmer, the farmer then... <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. The, the global divide conversation, not, not just in the aspect of uh, hunger, but also about science and technology, as well as innovation, uh, that's a conversation that will come up as to how limited we are on the side of the divide. We are, so, and it's not that the technologies are inaccessible to us. A lot of the technologies that uh, we're talking about, as I said, Wacky has been training mm, uh, world-class mm. plant breeders here. It is for us to invest more in that. Otherwise, we are just markets for solutions that are outside that are not specific for our problems. We have problems of, say, uh, weevils in cowpea. Uh, Ghana uh, recognized this and brought about an improved strain of cowpea. So farmers are benefiting. Nigeria did the same. The commercial um, PBR cowpea is an improved variety that is pest resistant. Farmers are richer. They're not spraying their crops every year. They're not getting the toxic chemicals in their body and they're getting a better harvest. So we advocate for science solutions that 
solve our problems. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're importing solutions and retrofitting them to, to you and paying a premium because you're importing solutions. Science is open. These, these technologies are open to all that want to use them and deploy them. Finally, will Africa eventually move out of hunger? I live for that day and I personally made a commitment that I will not stop until I see hunger end in my lifetime. I grew up in rural Nigeria. Um, I didn't leave till I was 10. Um, and when I was there, I remember that every day as I was coming home from school, the only thought was food, what you're going to eat. Christmas, what are you thinking about? Not presents, <laughs> food. Food was yeah, the thing on our mind. Yeah. But why was it on our minds all the time? Because we were food insecure. We were not thinking of going to space. We were not thinking of becoming Beyonce or any of those sorts of rock stars. We were thinking of It was more about the eating. basic need. And food. once you, you make a child's world such a small thing, the focus of my day mm -hmm. is that I eat. How can I focus on my education or anything else? So we need to take that away from this generation. In my lifetime, I do believe we will end hunger. We should. We will. Inspiring. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sheila Shigoju, for joining us here uh, on The Pulse. We talk about politics now because the flag bearership race within the governing New Patriotic Party is heating up as the Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Dubamia, is uh, the latest to pick up nomination forms for the upcoming contest. Uh, this brings the number of aspirants to seven uh, so far, uh, with more expected to join the race. Uh, but the party says it is uh, not overwhelmed by the numbers and still... Uh, is open to any interested party and qualified individual who wants to pick up the nomination form. My colleague Samuel Bura uh, of our political desk has more from the NPP headquarters. The nomination forms for the vice president were picked on his behalf by his campaign team led by former first vice national chairman of the party, Fred Owari, and former youth organizer and organizer and now CEO of the National Lottery Authority, Samir Wuku. So we came here to pick the forms for Dr. Baudia. That assignment has been completed, and so we're going back to the office. So what next? When officially are we going to hear you launch your campaign? Well, uh, that, the candidate himself would announce that. So we know that as a vice president, people were expecting large crowd. Why is that the situation? No, no, this is a private assignment. This is a private assignment. So um, what do you have to tell Ghanaians? When we, are, when we are ready to communicate, we'll communicate. What exactly will we be communicating? Um, when the forms are filled and being submitted. Although the team from the vice president did not organize a crowd of party supporters for the picking of nominations, some of them who came to the party office told Joy News, Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Bahamia is the only person that can lead the party to retain power in 2024. Oh, yeah, Apart from Penny Fonso Mukos, will be a new yam. Obia bet me LED and be a But yeah, but you bet me we need MPP 2024. My we, inshallah, we believe we are crossing the road because if if MPP want to break eight, it's with Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. You don't need to mobilize people from all regions to come and convey, uh, converge here just to pick forms. So if they know you, you don't need to bring supporters. Yeah, for, for uh, what are they coming to do? The race for the flag bearer in the NPP is expected to see more members joining the contest. One of such persons is energy expert Kojo Poku, who believes with his expertise, he will be the right person to lead the party and salvage the country. I'm bringing innovation. I'm bringing competence. People think that leadership is about popularity. It's not. I have always said that innovation over popularity, innovation over um, competence over popularity. A lot of people don't know me. And it's not the reason. The party constitution says that um, you have to be in five years in good standing and you basically can lead the party. So if you do not know me and I'm not popular, my good work will bear fruit and you will now get to know who I am. Meanwhile, Director of Elections for the NPP, Evans Nimako said, any interested party member in good standing can pick forms to join the presidential race. We are open till next month 24th. Whoever is ready, party person in good standing, with the capacity uh, to become a president, is, is allowed to procure forms. How much is the final? 
the party's uh, National Executive Committee National Council uh, directed uh, on the 3rd of April that all prospective candidates for presidential who procure their forms at uh, 50,000 Ghana CD and upon submission uh, support the party to run its uh, primaries with uh, 300,000 Ghana CD. So that is what has been put out there by the party. The nominations are still opened till next month, but notable aspirant, former trade and industry minister Alan Kojo Chermante, is yet to officially join the race. Samuel Mbura, Joy News. I'm back in studio. Uh, we're fortunate to be joined by one of the aspirants going into the contest, uh, Mr. Kujopoku. Thank you uh, thank for you your time. Well. You? And thank you for joining us. I'm doing well. Well, it's a very day. busy day, but when you join you call, why not? I mean, at <laughs> the end of the day, we have to and get we to, are, we have to honor we, them. We day. are indeed grateful that you're spending some time with us. Um, you're adding up to the numbers to so make it seven? Well, we are ten. So I'll be surprised if okay, all but, ten. But don't let's be. leave the three. Well, now. I'm just telling you that don't be surprised <laughs> when it's, it's at seven. We know three more people. You're will expecting, and you're expecting. No, them. we know that it will mm, be ten. Mm. And that's the big, big, I mean, the bigger challenge, if I should use that word, uh, because uh, the requirements of your constitution, you you may have to go for. We will go for a super delegate. And a super delegate delegates on the twenty uh, sixth of August. Th that's going to be tough. Is Why it? is it going to be tough? The super Turning delegate is made up of. Flashing the number. Hold on. The, Super delegate is made up of about 900 people. 900. Okay. The main election in November mm -hmm. is made up of 230,000 people. So you mean it will be easier dealing with It's 900. easier with nine, of course. If you can't convince 900 people to vote for you, mm -hmm. how are you going to convince 230,000 people to vote for you? So I don't see how people think that the super delegate is difficult. Mm -hmm. The super delegate is 900 people mm -hmm. who are constituency chairmen, regional executives, NEC, um, um, uh, elders of the party, uh, uh, elders of the party, the council of elders, then um, MPs and uh, NEC, and I mean uh, the organs. But, but you agree that the, representative the, the, from there each are other. diverse views on electoral colleges and, and what it portends for candidates going into elections. Yes, and, I because know. Because if you're dealing with just 900, um, the feeling is that some sex within the political party well, one you know, to, may, may not necessarily favor you and they could kick you out. Well, that's fine. Not, I mean, it, 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 it's fine. Well, the, good thing, the good thing I, I want to put out there yeah. is that what Ghanaians should understand is that 9900, yeah. in by no means, in no imagination or statistics, yeah. represent the entire 230,000. So though the party constitution states that those 900 people have the responsibility to um, trim filter down, it down, down to trim it to five, right. that is what we have to abide by. Mm. But if we go into that superdelegate and somebody comes up and get, let's say, 80% or 75%, it is in no form of shape mm -hmm. represent the popularity of that person on oh, the bigger... I get your point. You, you understand? So, so you may have a popular figure. You might have you a... may not cross... The, the super delegate. Yes, because maybe you are not addressing or you are not talking to the 900 people. And because, look, these are seasoned politicians who are within the party. Mm. Some of them have been around for so many years. To get to a, a constituency chairman of the party and above to regional level, you must have been around for a bit. But the polling station executives, which is this makes the majority, majority yeah. over 190,000, some of them have just joined the party. OK, so for me, I'm saying that let's not. And this is what a lot of people are going to make people feel mm -hmm. that, oh, maybe somebody yes. out of the super delegate will get like 70 percent of the vote. Let's assume that yes. somebody does. Yes. Right. And I could who goes through mm -hmm. with, let's say, 40 percent of the vote. Yeah. It doesn't mean that he is popular mm -hmm. among the 20 to 230,000. The 230,000 is a different set of people with different diverse views. Well, where do you see yourself, first of all, with the 900? With the 900. Yes, because you are 10. Uh, we are, we are 10. Have to, have to well, everybody will yes, have to right. get a minimum of at least 150 mm -hmm. to go through. Mm -hmm. Aiko Jupoku will definitely get that 150 to go through. Wow. But for the others, the feeling is I, your party, your party may, be, may be denied the opportunity of having that democratic process of choosing the very best. No, but the very best. Mm -hmm. Look, a constituency chairman mm -hmm. represents the feel the makeup and of the constituency. So the polling station executives, the electoral area coordinators would always be able to feed their energy to the constituency chairman. The constituency chairmen are very savvy. 
So they will do what's right for their constituency. So if you come out with a certain number of votes, yeah. all I'm saying is that yeah. it's just an exercise to trim down the number. Let not anybody interpret that as a representation of the 230,000 people. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Could you let me pick up your thoughts on uh, this analogy that you're picking up your nomination forms on the same day that a group of individuals have picked up the form on behalf of the vice president, someone who's leading next to the first, leading your government as the NPP now. Uh, if there's a reason for you to back down, uh, should this not be indicative enough that you have the vice president indicating that he wants to run uh, for the top job within your party? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, he's a candidate. I mean, when it comes to what I'm concerned with, he's a candidate, Dr. Baumia. I don't see him in the contest I'm in as Vice President Dr. Baumia. Mm -hmm. He's serving a vice presidential term, which ends on um, 24th, um, uh, 28th, 7th or 8th January 2025. In this contest, he is candidate Baumia, though he's... A that's citizen, how you see it. That's how I see it, yes. Okay. But he is a certain vice president, right? But when I go out there to tell the people my message, I don't go and talk about other people. I go and talk about Kujupoku. I don't feel, in, and it's, it's a coincidental. Yeah. I never knew. And that's you why gonna, you, I hope you understand uh, why. Right, I, I understand, yes, yes, perfectly. Because you're picking on the same day. No, but I, it, it was coincidental, also, right? Okay. Maybe he heard I was picking on the same day. <laughs> and, and then he, he decided, decided to, to pick on that, that day because I've been making noise. Mm. I was in the north over the weekend. Okay. So a lot of people went and picked on Friday. So my team has been asking me, ah, could you, when are you going to pick? And I said, I'll pick on um, Tuesday morning. Okay. Then yesterday I heard that the doctor is picking on Tuesday okay. morning. Maybe he heard I was picking and he decided to come and gate crash my party. You know, so for me, look, it's just a good thing mm -hmm. that the two um, big names in the party, yeah. myself and Doctor, happen to pick it today. Alan will be joining soon. Well, whenever he decides to pick, mm -hmm. we never know. What plans do you have for the NPP uh, and the nation as a whole? Oh, with NPP, we need to do a lot of reforms. The party, it's a constituency-based party. It's not a national-based party. We have MPs from the constituency. We don't have MPs from the region or the national. Resources have to be channeled to the constituency. Attention has to be paid to the constituency. If there is ever a time that MPP needs to take the constituency serious is now. In the past, we've muted the idea that, oh, it doesn't matter, even if we have minority in parliament, we can still rule with the president. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody would admit that it's not possible. So you can only generate or produce MPs if your constituency work is solid. So we need, we all saw what happened in Kumau, where we went there to basically, now we're going to do Asen as well. So look, the constituency, we can't overemphasize the work that needs to be done in the constituency. And that's been my message to everybody that I have met, that we need to reorganize the party and give more voice and more resources to the constituency leadership. And for me, at the, at the party level, we need to find resources to do some of these things. And we need to find a way to make the party more liquid than it is now even more so, find um, mechanisms that the party will continue to be liquid if by ever you are not in power. Mm -hmm. That's for the party. Then in the national agenda, I'm sure I've been on this platform when I itemized 10 points that I want to do. But I have narrowed it down because of time into basically four, five areas. One is local government. I believe that the bane of every development, in every country that has developed well, local government is key. We've been playing politics with local government and we've not been doing it the way it's supposed to be done. So I think that I need to put a lot of emphasis on local government. Two, early childhood education, okay? Children at the age of nine, there's a recent survey out there by UNICEF saying that only 8% of children at the age of nine in public schools can read and write. That is wrong. We need to concentrate on early child education, nursery education to P1, P2, to make sure that kids, their brain develop early so they get early child education. So I want to put emphasis and resources towards nursery education and primary early school education. Then we look at youth unemployment. Youth unemployment is going to swallow us one day if nothing drastic is done. I'm looking at three key things to do to solve that. Entrepreneurship, skill training, and creative arts. Okay. okay. So those are ideas that I have. Then also the economy. We need to greatly save money to change the course of where we are. Because if you look at the IMF document that came, it repeats the things that I've been saying. Clearly, you need to cut expenditure and save money. The difference between a poor person and a rich person is what? A poor person makes money, spends more, and keeps less. A rich person makes money, save more, and spend less. Your president is doing the same? Well, doing the same as what? 
We are not, not saving not, money. Not, we not, are not, in a trajectory we are on. No, we are not. Right. What took us to IMF is over expenditure. Mm. And I have criticized it from 2017, right. that from 2017, when we came in and realized that His Excellency John Dramani Mahama has taken us to IMF and we came out of IMF in 2018, we should have what, done austerity, cut down on the expenditure. We did not. We overspent, mm. thinking that, look, the economy is on the right track, we are expanding. We didn't build the right resilient economy, build the right shock absorbers. Then COVID hit, then Ukraine war hit, then all the things that we have done went away. Now we are back to IMF. So I'm saying that we need to build a resilient economy, and the only way to do that is to save money. These are fine ideas. But brilliant, how, how, brilliant ideas. Yeah, but, but how well known is Kojo Poku within the ranks of the New Patriotic Party? What's, what's been your contribution to the NPP? What's your constituency? I'm, I'm sure my you've been asked My constituency is Ayawaso West Wagon. And my constituency is Kwabri East. I have Ayawaso West Wagon where I live and work. Mm -hmm. Kwabri East, where I'm, I'm a native of, and my dad is the prominent chief in that area, mm -hmm. Mount mm -hmm. I support and I have adapted both constituencies very well, and I support them at that level very well. Mm -hmm. You see, party activities, yeah. maybe you go to church, you don't a society in church. If I'm in Pentecost mm -hmm. and you are in Roman, right. and you have a, a, a society in Roman that you belong to, me in Pentecost wouldn't know what you're doing at the society in Roman. That's what it is. We at MPP, we are at the constituency level doing what we can do. Somebody will say, I don't know you. But these are not things you do and go and do ton -ton -san -san and announce. So, yes, when it comes to the time, we have our receipts. When you do anything for the party, they give you receipts. We'll go to the party office and let everybody know that, look, these are what things we have done. A lot of things that ones do for this party, you can't even talk about. Because, look, it's a non-governmental organization. It's an NGO, right? There are things that you can't talk about if you've done for the party. A lot of people are out there saying that, oh, we did this and we did this. It can get the party into trouble because some things are not allowed as a party. There is rules that governs some of these things. For some of us, our own is that, look, we've been around since 98. And that counts for something. I served well within His Excellency John Ejikum Kufo's government. I was a special assistant at the Ministry of Tourism for three years. I worked with Anaga Binketia, I worked with Dr. Preku throughout the period, and I worked closely with His Excellency John Ejikum Kufo till 2008. So when somebody says they don't know me, is it that they just came mm -hmm. and they don't know us who worked in, for the eight years of J.A. Kufo? Because they just came. That is the dichotomy that we find ourselves in. So you in get the party. asked that question I, all the time. Often. Even today, I oh, had that. Oh, uh, you were asked oh, that question. They, uh, some people at the party office yeah. said, oh, who do you know? But the point is, there is a young old man in uh, our, our win in the Sevibakwai area, north, west, Western North, right? He's been a police station chairman since 92. Nobody knows him in Accra. Doesn't mean that he has not served the party well and he's not in good standing. So we should stop that. We should make sure that it's not only people we know. My emergence is a trailblazer. Mm -hmm. Me coming through this will set a stage for a lot of young people who also want to do this and think that, look, we don't have to wait till we are gray hair and dye the hair black before we go and do this thing. I see. Uh, probably why they may not know you will be about issues re relating to resources and how the big spenders, quote and unquote, on your political party go about town indicating publicly what it is that they've done for the party. Big spenders as in what? You see, you, the only you, reason... some of it's, No, no, it's a, it's, it's a shenanigans. It's shenanigans. Right. Okay, shenanigans in the sense that I am the only one running that have never held a party position, no ministerial position, nothing, right? So it's new. Right. I'm the first person to ever step up to say that I'm going to do this. I've never been through the ranks of the party. Right. Mostly, everybody, all 10 of them who's running, have been ministers, have been this, well, have I've been party in chairman, have served in yeah. other capacities. That's why they want to do this. I call it politics of progression, right? That whole mantra of a drumiso. It's politics of progression. Mm -hmm. You feel entitled that because I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've been an MP for 21 years, so it's time to be president. I've been minister for this number of years, so it's time to be president. It's called politics of progression. It feels more like an entitlement. Mm -hmm. Me, I'm a businessman, a party member of good standing. Mm -hmm. I see what's going on as wrong. I want to come in and change it. So what do I do? I come in, I step up, and I hold my sword and stand a post. That is what I want to do. I'm coming in not to do what everybody's doing. I'm coming in to do something new because I realize that what is new, no Nobody's doing that. And Kojo, this is going to cost you a lot. The last CDD survey indicating that um, anyone who attempts to, to become president must have or should be prepared to spend close to 100 million US dollars. How much even does the country have to spend 100 million? Please stop that. You know, all these things are things people do to scare the youth. Right. Look, mm. 
Like I said, how much I, I, am trail, I am a trail. So let me I am a trail. I'm not going to put a figure on. I'm not. I'm not prepared to put. Campaign? I'm not prepared to put a figure on my contribution mm -hmm. towards the party and the base of the party. Look, what this party needs and what this party appreciates. I have gone around the country twice. I went around all 16 regions last year. I've been around all 16 regions this year. One thing I can assure you is that it's not about money. It's about a message and showing appreciation to the people who come to meet you. If you want to go around spreading money, that's fine. Nobody will say no to money. You, you Even I will not say no to money. Will not, will not ask well, my, money. my brother, to ask and be given is two different things. You know what I mean? If you feel you that they... give money? No, no, no. no. I'm, listen to me, yeah. please. I you, said that... You won't give money. You, well, no, I'm not going to say that. Right. What I'm saying to you is that the delegates appreciate two things. A good message and appreciation. With if money, somebody, hold on, hold on, hold on, let me, let, let me land. Mm. A good message and appreciation. Let me give you a typical example. As the delegates, right, you are supposed to go to the people and disseminate your information. Mm. But then you go to Borga and ask that the people in the Upper East region come and meet you in Borga right. because you don't want to spend your time going to all um, constituencies mm. in Upper East. Then they come to meet you. Who do you think should fold their car? They should come at their own expense or you should give them if the fall? If they love you, they should come. No, there's no such thing as love. They spend their... If you were to go to them, mm -hmm. if you were to go to them, you go there with a the fall. So it is only courteous. That is where the appreciation comes in. Right. It's only courteous that the person takes transportation to come to hear your message, but you at least take care of their transportation. That is not the money you are talking about. That is not the 100 million. Right. Okay, right. because that, what is going on with transportation? How much is transportation? That's what I'm saying that you need a message mm. and appreciation. You can't let somebody travel four hours in, four hours out, and just give the person a message and let his transportation be his cost. The appreciation is that you should appreciate that the person came to listen to you right. and you should pay for his fault. It's only fair. So that money that they are mentioning, you can't go and think that it's about money and start throwing money around. Everybody will take your money. Even I, Kujupoku, will take your money. But would I vote for you? It's a different thing altogether. Okay, uh, Kujopuku, we, we wait to see um, at the end of the how many people will join and uh, of course the vesting process will go through. Yes, I, I'm, I'm praying that there is a tedious process from perusing the form. Right. You need to take the form physically to all 16 regions to have it endorsed, which we have people ready to do that. So we are ready to get that done. We would submit it in, in good time. By 15th of June, we will be submitting the form and then we take it from there. Okay, then. Kojo Puku, thank you. Thank Great you very for, much, my brother. For your time. We take you live now to Budumura, my colleague Max Olagbogba, standing by, of course, uh, after today's uh, uh, incident. Uh, let's get some updates uh, from Max. Max, where are you and uh, what can you report? <laughs> Yes, blessed. Um, as you rightly stated, I'm currently um, here at Budumburam. Um, a cloud of grief still hangs around this community um, after news reached residents here and people who do business here um, that their friends, their colleagues have died in an accident um, in a road crash where system people um, died. We are currently um, at the bus terminal where one of the buses uh, was traveling to. This is where that trip was supposed to um, terminate, but it did not end um, here. It ended at Gomorrah Circle where system people um, died. Behind me is the bus terminal where that bus, which was coming from um, Ivory Coast, uh, was supposed to um, arrive at. Now, some of the people we've been interacting with here tell us that they really do not understand the circumstances and that this happened. Some of them are attributing it to spiritual causes. Of course, that has been discounted by the um, municipal uh, fire service um, commander, um, Chrissy Hughes. Um, he says the stretch where the crash happened is a long curve and it's important for drivers to take their time um, when they get to that part of the road. But joining me right now, um, two gentlemen, I have two gentlemen here joining me right now. Bob Hagan, he's the executive member of the GPRTU Ghana, Liberia. I also have Emmanuel Entry, who is the um, secretary of BAPS um, Transport. Let me speak to them. Let me find out from them um, what they actually know about this incident. Bob, um, I know you've lost a friend, so we have our condolences. Um, you were actually at the morgue. And you saw your friend, and um, you mentioned his name as a Japan. Clement you said, Japan, that is his name. What's his name? Clement Ejapon. Clement Ejapon. What does he do? 
Yeah, he's a driver and also a conductor. So he's a driver at this bus stop? No, 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 he was the conductor. He's the one leading the, the car from Liberia to Ghana. So yesterday he called around 8 o'clock in the morning that he had uh, a libel. So when they go through with the custom processing, they decide to even rest some, for some time. So we are all expecting him later this morning by even 8 o'clock. They will be arrived here. So this morning around 6.30, I received a call from a colleague that there's an issue. I said, what is the issue? He couldn't even come out to tell me what actually is the problem. So when I got here, I leave Kaswa. When I got here, then I received a message that this is what has happened. So right away, we rushed to the accident scene. When we get there, they are already moving their bodies. Those that got injuries, those that are wounded, those that even right away, they even lost their life. And I saw my friend and colleague, Clement Japon. His situation was very tough, very bad off. So all what I have to tell the people that in the bus, those that have their loved ones, I wish all of them will take heart. Because since we established this business, GPR to Ghana Liberia Station, we never even come across with such tragedy before. This is the first time. So sometimes every business there is a lapses and whatever. But this kind of accident we never come across before. So as I'm speaking, what I saw in the mud, that the uh, uh, people that they are saying they have passed away, I saw five dead bodies which they are coming to our station. And the tanker driver, the, the mate, also lost his life. So the dead body I saw in the mud, total, the total was six. I saw which by I have the videos and the other things. Yeah, so you saw six um, bodies at the mall. Yeah. Um, the municipal fire commander, uh, Winneba municipal fire commander, yeah. is telling us that 16 people died. And he tells us that um, some persons have had some of their body parts severed. Some of them have lost their, um, their limbs and all of that. I'll come back to you. But how is Emmanuel Japan now? Emmanuel Japan is now a disease. He's, no he's dead. He's dead, yeah. But you spoke to him yesterday? I spoke to him yesterday. Since he's been coming, we can be communicate to each other. I spoke to him yesterday morning, around 8 o'clock. Mm. What, what, what kind of person was Imano? Come again. What kind of person was a Japan? A Japan. And what are your fondest memories of? A Japan is a man, a little bit jovial, calm. And what even pained me most is we lost. I lost my nephew. I couldn't go to Liberia. Mm. So he is the one who goes to on my behalf so that the funeral goes on. So they buried my nephew, I think, two weeks ago. Then he started coming back to Ghana. Then this incident happened to him. So I wish his family very farewell and I, I give them a condolence to them. I'll come back to you shortly. Uh, you stay here, right? Oh. I'll come back to you shortly. Uh, Imano Lynchy, Imano Lynchy is the secretary um, at Babs Transport, and uh, you operate a transport company. Um, tell me, was that one of your vehicles involved in the crash? Actually, with a vehicle we got involved in, um, in the accident, it happens to be a vehicle from the station. But then, it was a chartered bus. Let me put it that way: chartered by. I mean, two charter men to Liberia. So on their way, come on their way back. That is when this issue happened. I think last night, a, a day before yesterday, personally, I spoke to Clemente Japon, I mean, the guy who chartered the bus, concerning some money he was supposed to receive from some people here in Ghana. And I asked of when he will be coming. He told me he is just at there. He will be at the Libo border. I mean, last night, I spoke to him three days ago, but he told me he would be at the border last night. So last night I called and he told me they were there. So after going through the custom processes, they had to, I mean, rest and then pick up from that place to, uh, I mean, to Ghana. But yesterday morning, I mean, this morning, I never called him. I was just there, I came to work. I was called, and then he informed me of what happened that the bus has been involved or the bus has involved in an accident. 
Mm. And according to him, 16 people have lost their lives. The total people on carriage was, I think, 60 people. The total passengers in the bus was around 60. Mm. And out of the 60, we yeah. lost 16 out of it. Um, you have our condolences. But you also know Clement is upon you, I know, I know, I know. He's your colleague. He's my colleague. I know him very well. I know Japan very well. I never wished this for him, but you know, we can't just predict nature. Anything can happen at any point in time in life. So what I'll say to the family of these people is that the one who gave them to the family has taken them back. You know, I'm just such a voice. Yeah. I don't even know Take what to say. Yeah. I don't know what to say now. Yeah. Take what was the last time you had any kind of interaction with Emmanuel? Last time, as I said earlier, it was three days ago. That is when I spoke to a Japan concerning a woman who was a passenger who was supposed to give him some money from here in Ghana. That was the last day I spoke to him. I think last night to yeah. I spoke to a Japan through my boss's phone. My boss called him and then I was able to speak to him. That was the last day I spoke to a Japan. So far, since you operate this transport company, have you had any family members come in here or calling you the know, Babs transport to find out uh, the fate of their relatives? You know, most of the people happen to be librarians. And a few Ghanaians we have there, we've contacted them. Well, I think most of them are currently at the Winneba Hospital now. Most of them. Some were here in the morning and later went to the hospital. So currently they are all at the hospital as I'm speaking now. Yeah, that is what I can say for now. I'll come back to you shortly, but let me come to you, Bob. Um, a lot of people have raised concerns about the Gumwa Ochreko, Ochreko. Uh, Ochreko stretch. Um, many of them say that it has become an accident prone area. Um, sometime last year, we've lost a lot of Ghanaians on that stretch. Sometime last year, we lost three foreigners, tourists actually, um, on that particular road. As an executive of the um, GPRG, have you had cause to also complain or raise concerns about um, how dangerous that stretch is? The municipal, whenever we need municipal um, fire commander tells us that it's a long curve and drivers have to take their time when they get to that part of the road. Yeah, uh, what I know about that uh, particular area is like, uh, it's a two hill. Coming from Accra, coming from Accra, yeah. before reaching to Ochiriko, Gomo Ochiriko, you have to descend down. Yeah. And from Winneba, you have to come down. So from the Ochiriko bridge, Ochiriko is a river. So on that bridge, yeah. as the only place is a stretch. So when you're coming down, you have to be a speed so that you come and climb the other hill. If you're coming from Takradi, you have to come down with speed, speed before you climb the hill that coming to Accra. And from Accra, you have to come down with speed before you climb the one going to Winneba. So that particular place is always give a challenges to the drivers. Okay. And most time it's a little bit sharp curve, if I'm not mistaken, about 60 degrees. So mostly we can even hear most of the tragedy over there, which we don't even like it but one thing i notice it our road is single road if this road is going to be something double road i think sometimes the way this our uh, bus driver was dodging this tanker driver because the trunk uh, tanker driver misses road he lose control so our bus driver that's musa was trying to dodge because Where is musa too now musa is in trauma okay yeah so when he trying to dodge the car, that is the reason because they were already close to each other. So you couldn't even dodge the tanker driver. That is why the side, the whole side of the car, just and those who were sitting. And my friend and colleague in Japan, Clement in Japan, was sitting right at the front. So I can't even say it on air the way his body is looking now.
very, very, very trauma. I'm even sad. Since this morning, I've even been living with water. I'm not wishing to eat. It's very, very sorrowful. Very sorrowful because the, the, the municipal, uh, uh, the Winneba Municipal Fire Service commander told us that some persons have had some of their body parts severed, that's, sliced that, off. That, that is that is a uh, 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 Kremen to Japan's body. Mm. Yeah, in one leg, one hands, the body has been divided into two. So it's very painful. It's very very painful. My my brother and friend and colleague died a painful death. I wish him. May the good Lord keep you in the Abraham bosom. That's it. You, the, the call for a lot of people here, um, many of the people we've been speaking to here, tell us that they think dual courage way is the way to go. They think is the solution to the many road crashes we've experienced, especially on the Accra Cape Coast um, Highway. You, Imanol Lynchy, you agree with all these comments that we've been hearing here at this bus terminal? Exactly. You know, the road should be just be, I mean, dual carriage. Yeah. Yes, to, I mean, ease certain traffic and then others. You know, where they had an accident, it actually happened to be a single carriage road. So should a car, I mean, overtake each other, definitely that thing will happen all the time. So what we are pleading, or our plea to the government is that that road, I mean, the Accra Cape Coast Road, should be made or should be dual carriage. That is all we want for now. That is exactly what we want. Because you know, I can't just leave home to feed home and all this happens to me. So our plea to the government is that that road, the Accra Cape Coast or Accra too, I mean, Accra Cape Coast should, should be dual carriage. That is what we want. That is what we want. That is exactly what we want here. Thank you. Okay. Let, let me wrap up with um, Bob Hagan. Bob, you were at the hospital, right? Yes, yes, I was there. Um, you saw other persons who were also injured from the um, from the accident, from the road yeah, crash. Yeah. What's, what's their state? Yeah, with the accident scene, what I saw... No, at, I mean at the hospital? At the hospital I'm talking yeah, about. Those who survived, what, what's their state? Oh, now? there's a many. Because there are the 57 passengers on board. Mm. And most of them are in a critical condition. Mm and some of them too are responding the doctors have been discharging some of them and what i saw at the mortuary was the uh, six dead bodies uh, the, as i said earlier on the tanker uh, driver the mate the mate and the passengers that are coming to us also there are five a japan included uh, joe water uh, there is a lady among them they call Auntie Freeman. She too, she also gone. So you know Auntie Freeman? And I know her very good. Uh, we are we are business people. We know each she other. She lives here. She she's a Ghanaian. She was coming from Liberia. I don't know what she's coming to, but she, she always do a business with us, buying some things and even go and sell it in Liberia. So it's very painful. I I speaking now. I'm even really grieving in my heart that. Our, we are not expecting this to happen. Since we established this business, Ghana, Liberia, we never and ever come across with this terrible accident in our offices like this. So what I want to say in short is, as for this road, we really want this road to be dual carriage road. Because this is the design from even during Nkrumah time. Because I was told that this is our international road and the, this road is even leading to even Johannesburg. If you want to even drive by road, this road can carry you straight to Johannesburg. So we are just appealing, we are appealing to the elders of this country, they should help us, president and the ministers, they should help us so that we get this road done in very carried way. But those who too lost their loved ones, their family, their husbands, their mommies and their children because there is a baby among the dead bodies. A baby? A baby around one year, six months or two years. If you want the video, I can give you, but I think it's not necessary. So I'm asking God to even console them. We human, we can't console anyone. Only God can give them that 
restful peace. And those who too lost their life, may their soul rest in perfect peace in Abraham Bosom. Thank you. Thank you very much for talking to us. So I've been speaking to um, Bob Hagan. Bob Hagan is an executive of the GPRTU, Ghana Private Road Transport Union, Ghana, Liberia. Uh, he was at the mock where the system people who died um, were taken um, to. He also um, saw some of the survivors um, at the hospital as well. He lost his friend, Clement, um, in Japan. You also heard from Yumano Linchi, who is the secretary of um, BAPS Transport, and they operate a transport company here, a transport company that that moves to, their vehicles move to Abidjan, um, Sierra Leone, Mali, um, and other parts, other West African uh, you know, um, countries. And this is where um, the system passengers who died uh, were actually um, coming to before that crash happened. They were very close to home, but far away from home. Reporting from Budumbram, my name is Maxwell, I'm about to you, bless you. And now the Supreme Court has uh, cautioned lecturer at the University of Ghana and member of the NDC, Professor Michael Basawai, to desist from making comments that uh, denigrate the courts. This warning uh, was given after a five-member panel of the court convicted Professor White uh, of the offences of contempt of court. This uh, case bothered on a series of tweets made by Professor White on May 19. He was asked to appear before the court to show cause why he should not be cited for contempt for scandalising the Supreme Court, bringing uh, into ridicule the dignity, respect and stature uh, of the court and inciting prejudice against uh, the members of uh, the bench. Legal Affairs correspondent Joseph Akabli has the rest of the story. Professor White was accompanied to court by some senior officials of the NDC, including former CEO of the National Health Insurance Authority, Sylvester Mensah. When the case was called, Professor White was asked to indicate whether he accepts a plea of guilty or not guilty. Initially, he informed the court he was not guilty. He later informed the court again that he was guilty with explanation. When he was asked by presiding judge Maria Mowusu to state his plea in clear terms, he responded that he was guilty. It was at that point that his lawyers, led by Dr. Justice Sai, informed the court that as far as they are concerned, this is a matter for which he had admitted to the offence and has proceeded to render an apology even before appearing in court. They did point out that, in fact, he had caused the publication to be made in the Ghanaian Times on its front page, apologising to the court before even showing up. And so on that basis, they urged the court that it tampers justice with mercy and does not impose a harsh sentence on Professor White, especially because of the conduct which has, they believe, purges him of contempt. Uh, the court went for recess for about 30 minutes and returned with the announcement that its conclusion was to the effect that uh, he is cautioned and discharged. This is Maria Mowus, who presided over the proceedings, uh, did make the point that Professor White has quite a following and so it was important that whatever comments he makes, he is mindful of them. She did indicate that even under the said publications that were made, uh, the court realized that there were a series of comments that were essentially comments that people were attacking the court because they had been led into that temptation to carry out such attacks by virtue of the comments that Professor White put on social media. Uh, Professor Mensa Bonsu, a justice of the Supreme Court, pointed out that as a full professor of Legon herself, she knows that Professor White being an associate professor is not by any, it's not any mean feat and so it's one that is very valuable and it's an individual that is highly respected and so he, he is expected to lead society in a certain direction and so they expect him going forward not to engage in such a conduct. After proceedings he was accompanied by his colleagues who had joined him here and they simply said that they were happy that the court had reached this particular conclusion. So we thank the court. Thank you so much. And the media. Thank you. We just want to thank Thank you. Thank you. And God bless you for your cooperation. Amen. And so that is the end of the matter by way of this particular case against Professor uh, Michael Professor White. For joining us on the Supreme Court, my name is Joseph Akable.
And here the studios and blessings are now wrapping up the polls uh, here on the Join News Channel. We still have a lot more coming your way. Please stay.